Welcome to the Justice Journal Podcast. I'm Sacramento County District Attorney Anne Marie Schubert. I hope you enjoy this podcast series where we discuss important public safety issues and provide insight into who we are as an office and what we do both in the courtroom and in the community to provide the highest level of public safety through prosecution, prevention, and innovation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Justice Journal podcast. I am your host, Rochelle Beardsley. Today, today's episode is a part of a series of podcasts focusing on the success our local criminal justice system has had in holding jury trials in an age of a pandemic. We're going to discuss three specific cases today. These were all completed by jury trial with the prosecutors who handled them. Our guests today are Sacramento County Principal Criminal Attorney Nancy Cochran. Welcome. Thank you. Deputy District Attorney Kristen Anderson. Good morning. Morning. And Deputy District Attorney Ryan Roebuck. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, why don't we start by having each of you introduce yourself? We'll start with uh, Ms. Cochran and tell us how long you've been with the office and what unit you're currently working in. Sure. Uh, I've been with the office now for almost 25 years, and uh, I have been involved in many of the different units, but currently I am working in the child abuse unit, and I've been here for approximately 11 years. We prosecute all crimes against children uh, under the age of 14 in our unit, and we uh, uh, prosecute physical abuse as well as sexual abuse. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Anderson? I, I'm Kristen Anderson. Um, I've been in the district attorney's office about 13 years. I've worked um, like Nancy, but not as extensively in a lot of different units in our office. And actually during the pandemic is when I was moved over to the homicide unit. So I've only been in the homicide unit about uh, four or five months. Great. Mr. Roebuck. Thank you. Um, so I've been at the office just over three years, and I'm currently on felony trial team two, um, where we handle basically just general felonies of all sorts. Right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. So before we get into your specific cases, I want to provide our listeners with a overview of what the criminal justice, the trial procedure was pre-COVID-19. So prior to COVID-19, cases were assigned out of one courtroom. We, we refer to it as our master calendar and that in Sacramento County's department nine in the courthouse. On any given day, about maybe a hundred plus attorneys, folks would, would cram themselves into department nine to wait and see if they could get assigned out to trial. We would just show up. We didn't know if we were gonna get a courtroom or if there was gonna be a defense uh, request to continue. We just showed up. We didn't know if we were gonna get out to trial, but that's what the process was. Uh, prior to COVID-19, we did not social distance. So during jury selection, we would cram about 60, sometimes upwards of 80 to 100 uh, prospective jurors into one courtroom to do the process of jury selection, which also took a couple of days sometimes. Uh, we didn't wear masks at all. Um, at any time during the trial, and we could see each other's faces, which is important when you're selecting a jury, when you're eliciting testimony, when you're op when you're providing an opening statement or a closing argument. So we could see everybody, witnesses, lawyers, jurors. Uh, courtrooms were also open to the public. Uh, anyone could enter the courthouse at any given time, walk into any courtroom that was having a proceeding, and sit down and observe. And that was part of the process. So things obviously changed a great deal post COVID and we're gonna start talking about that. So I think the three of you would probably agree that things have changed drastically since the courts initially shut down in March of this year. Uh, we in fact didn't start doing or conducting jury trials again until probably the middle of June, if I'm correct. So I wanna start focusing on our differences, uh, on the differences during our discussion, but why don't we first start by having you guys talk a little bit about the facts of your case so that we can lay the groundwork. Wanna go first, Nancy? So, sure. Who's so going? we're gonna have uh, Ms. Cochran talk a little bit about her uh, child abuse case. Okay. Uh, the case uh, that I prosecuted um, in June of 2020 was a case against the defendant Fong Mua. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Mua was a former Alameda County Sheriff's deputy who had been investigated in 2004 for molesting a uh, female uh, child uh, in, in his family, uh, as well as um, domestic violence. He was investigated by the Alameda County Sheriff's uh, Department. He was placed on leave and was not uh, rehired after that investigation was over. Unfortunately, there was, uh, at that time, there was no consequence to Mr. Mua for any of the alleged crimes that were committed uh, against that family member. Uh, as we fast forward uh, to Sacramento County, Mr. Mua was accused of sexually molesting six members of his uh, immediate family. Uh, four of those uh, victims were now adults and two were minor children. Uh, the adult uh, victims came forward because one of the minor children had reported to them that they had been touched by Mr. Mua. An investigation uh, by the Sacramento Police Department ensued and um, ultimately Mr. Mua was arrested and charged with, with multiple counts of molesting not only the two minor children, but also the, the uh, four victims who were now um, adults. That uh, obviously went to trial and Mr. Mua was convicted of um, uh, 12 counts of child uh, sexual assault by jury. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go to Ms. Anderson, uh, who is going to talk to us about her uh, attempted murder of a police officer case. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, I did mine, uh, it started, I believe, the first week of July 2020. Um, my case was about three mm -hmm. years old. It had taken quite some time to get through um, the criminal process. So my victim and his family had waited three years to get to um, jury trials. So although it looked very different um, during the pandemic, they were very happy to um, start the process. So essentially three years ago in June of 2017, Deputy Ladwig, who had worked for the Sheriff's Department for about three or four years at the time, was on his normal routine um, patrol at the light rail station at Interstate 80 and Watt Avenue. Um, at that time, he encountered the defendant, Nikori Spann. Um, Nikori Spann was uh, extremely angry that day. He was yelling at the police officer. He was attempting to contact other civilians who were there. Um, so it wasn't um, initially just directed at the deputy. Um, when Deputy Ladwig attempted to find out what his purpose was for being at the station, whether he had a ticket, or not, um, Nikori Span failed to give him a valid ticket, which was required at that particular station at the time. Um, at that point, Nikori Span lunged at Deputy Ladwig um, and attempted to punch him in the face. Um, within seconds, unfortunately for uh, Deputy Ladwig, Nikori Span was able to gain control of the deputy's firearm um, and within a minute had uh, fired the gun twice uh, at close range at the deputy's face. He actually struck the deputy um, one time at close range um, in the side of the face and luckily for the deputy, he missed um, the second time. Uh, after that happened, um, luckily for Deputy Ladwig, a civilian actually, a Good Samaritan, jumped off the light rail and came to the deputy's aid, which was amazing. Um, and I think his testimony at trial was um, extremely moving. And I think the jury was also swayed by a lot of what he talked about. Um, but anyways, uh, Nikori Span after he shot the deputy in the face, ran um, to a neighboring hotel at the Red Roof Inn where he barricaded himself inside um, the hotel on one of the um, hotel walkways for approximately three and a half hours. The Sheriff's Department responded um, and after about three and a half hours, they were able to secure him safely where he was then arrested um, and um, taken into custody. Um, and then we waited for the three years to get to trial. Uh, Deputy Ladwig was spent 11 days in the hospital. He endured um, hundreds of doctor's appointments. 
um, 20 plus surgeries um, and amazingly was able to make almost a full recovery. And so by the time he was testifying three years later, he was able to um, speak very well on the stand and was actually testifying for um, a little over a day. Um, it could do it very well. So luckily for him, he's made a full recovery. Uh, the jury did convict um, Nicori Span of multiple charges, um, attempted murder on a police officer with the use of the firearm, which caused great bodily injury uh, to the deputy, and then just assault on a police officer. Um, and then he later was went on to be sentenced to 32 years to life. All right, thank you for that. Uh, let's move uh, to Mr. Roebuck's case. You're going to be talking to us about a felony burglary, is that right? Uh, yes, Rochelle. So my case um, took place back in October of 2018. Um, two elderly victims, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Rohrbach, uh, both in their mid-70s, were asleep in their home. Um, they went to bed around midnight on the night of October 1st. They woke up the next morning to find that the downstairs of their home had actually been burglarized while they were asleep. Um, they immediately contacted the Sacramento Sheriff's Department who sent crime scene investigators out to their home. And um, as they started to inventory, they realized uh, approximately $20,000 in various items had been taken. Um, this included a number of jewelry items, including a, a family heirloom of Mrs. Rohrbach, um, which was actually her diamond wedding ring that her mother had given her. That was the mother's ring as well. Um, in addition to that, there were cash, a number of jewelry items, and particularly of interest in that case was um, two cell phones or were two cell phones that were actually taken from an office uh, in the downstairs of their home. They also noticed that uh, a window above a desk in the office was open that they remembered closing the night before, as well as the door that led to the backyard uh, from that office. So once uh, CSI came out, they actually were able to lift uh, latent fingerprints from the window that was above the desk um, on that window, there were fingerprints both on the outside and just on the inside of the window frame itself. Um, CSI collected those prints and then submitted them to the sheriff's department for ID. Um, in these particular instances, those fingerprints were sent to the fingerprint identification specialist, but they weren't actually run until the summer of 2019. So essentially the case um, went cold in terms of leads for just under a year. Um, when a fingerprint specialist ran those latent prints, they uh, matched a suspect, Donald Mayberry. Um, that suspect was later arrested. Mr. Mayberry um, was brought to trial. He faced both a uh, first degree residential burglary charge as well as an enhancement for um, both victims being present in the home during the time of the robbery, as well as um, a prior strike allegation. Um, what ended up being the, the key piece of evidence in the case was that after Mr. Mayberry was arrested in 2019, a um, pawn search had been run on him. And he actually was found to have pawned one of the two cell phones at a, um, what's called an eco ATM, which is essentially an ATM type of machine that collects electronic devices at a mall. And so we were able to match um, him pawning one of the two cell phones that were taken uh, from the residents in addition to those fingerprints. Um, he was convicted ultimately of uh, the crime of burglary as well as um, the jury found his prior strike true. And then he was ultimately sentenced to 17 years in state prison. Thank you all for, for those summaries. They're obviously fairly, very serious cases um, that you were all able to successfully prosecute during the age of COVID. Um, let's, I want to go back again to um, Ms. Cochran. I want to, uh, let's take a deeper dive into the differences that uh, you observed or had to undergo uh, because you did get out to trial um, during this pandemic. Um, can you take us through um, pre, the pre-trial process, which includes um, the TRCs, uh, the trial, which is the trial readiness conference, and up to the, the case actually getting assigned out to trial, please. Yes. Um, in this particular case, uh, Mr. Mua was very anxious to have his jury trial. He was arraigned uh, in October of 2019. The preliminary hearing was almost immediately set. And from there, we had a number of preliminary hearing dates uh, as well as um, 
a couple resets for uh, trial dates. Um, eventually, the trial was uh, set um, for March of uh, March 26th of 2020. Uh, during that time, uh, there were issues that were beginning to happen because of the COVID pandemic. Um, eventually, um, on March 20th, prior to Mr. Mua actually getting out to trial, uh, the uh, courts closed. And um, actually on March 23rd, all trials had been suspended. So Mr. Mua's trial was then put um, basically in a queue and uh, had some priority based on the fact that we were ready to go to trial before the courts were closed down. Um, on June 15th, jury trials resumed in Sacramento County. And that was when we started the process of being assigned out for trial. So generally the trial readiness conference um, procedure is uh, that we have a hearing uh, with the defense and with what we call our home court judge to uh, discuss whether or not the trial is ready to proceed, whether both sides are prepared. Um, and we were able uh, to do that. Things were being done uh, via Zoom. Uh, and so things were a little bit uh, uh, obviously different in that sense. As you said earlier, um, we were not meeting face to face any longer. Generally, we would meet in court, uh, discuss the, the case with, um, with our judge, talk about the length of the trial and any issues that might be coming up in terms of whether, uh, uh, how long the, uh, we should be assigned out for and those kinds of issues. So ultimately um, trials resumed because Mr. Mua's case was more on the, um, uh, the priority track uh, because we had been set for trial. We were actually assigned out to trial on June 17th. And so that process, um, it happened, uh, the TRC process, the trial readiness conference process proceeded basically as it normally would, but for being held uh, on uh, Zoom. Uh, once we were assigned out to trial, uh, then there were different issues that came up in terms of how to proceed with jury selection, how we would meet uh, with the court, because um, prior to starting jury selection, you meet with your trial judge, you discuss issues, you exchange briefs. All of that was done electronically. So uh, the defense uh, and myself, we were exchanging uh, briefs and witness lists electronically. We were both sending these items to the court electronically. Uh, there was a lot of communication with the defense, uh, the court and myself via email. Um, and then there was uh, a set time when we did meet uh, in person with the court uh, and of course we followed all of the COVID procedures that the courthouse had put into, into place. But at that point we had been assigned to trial and we did process how jury selection would happen um, and uh, how, what steps the uh, court administration had put into place to make sure that uh, all parties as well as prospective jurors uh, and the court staff remain safe uh, during the pandemic. Thank you for that. So pre-COVID, what we would, we talked about the process and, and that would include showing up to the, to the master calendar court, which was department nine of the, in the courthouse and calling ready for trial and waiting to see if there was a courtroom available, right? And sometimes yeah. the court had the option of trailing your case another 10 calendar or 10 court days, right? Yes, that's right. correct. So, so how was your trial assignment process different than it was pre-COVID? Right, good point. Because pre-COVID, um, we would have a trial assignment calendar out of department nine in the main courthouse. And as you previously mentioned, we could have 80 people in that courtroom 
defense attorneys, uh, spectators, out of custody defendants, court staff. And uh, we would have previously checked in uh, on an electronic system to let the courts know whether or not both sides were ready. And if both sides were ready, we would proceed to this trial calendar with the hope and the expectation that we would be assigned out to a trial court. But as you mentioned, we would go to uh, the trial uh, assignment um, uh, calendar and oftentimes we would just sit and wait uh, for, uh, you know, to find out which courtrooms might be available, which courtrooms could take a trial of just a couple days or a few weeks or perhaps even longer than that. And oftentimes, um, even if both sides were ready to go to trial, if there were no additional courtrooms available, as you said, the court would ask us to come back in a day or two to find out whether or not there was another courtroom available. Once the pandemic um, started and the, the courts were doing everything uh, by way of uh, either Zoom or electronics, then we would do this basically the same thing. We would, uh, we would determine whether or not we were ready to proceed uh, we would be in communication with um, the, uh, the court staff who was responsible for letting the assignment judge know. And then we would wait to see whether or not we had been given a courtroom. And all of that was done electronically. Um, so there was a lot of communication between the defense attorneys, our office, and the court administration in uh, trying to determine which cases would be assigned out to trial and when they would be assigned out to trial. Yeah. Big difference. Thank you. Um, let's talk through uh, the jury selection process now. And I want to uh, go to you, uh, Ms. Anderson. Can you walk us through the differences in your jury selection process for your trial? Well, pretty much it looks completely different other than the fact that our uh, some of our jurors are in the courtroom um, with the DA. So um, let me back up a little bit. Um, you know, before the pandemic, um, jury selection was myself, judge, court staff, defense attorney, defendant, and then anywhere from 80 or 60 jurors in any given courtroom. I mean, you're, you're literally packed into the courtroom next to each other. Um, and um, then we pull up what we call the six pack, which is 18 people. We put 12 people in um, the jury selection box and then we sit six people in front. And then the judge goes through a pretty basic questionnaire. It was one page generally, unless you were involved in some sort of uh, life sentence case or a homicide. And then sometimes it was a little bit more extensive. Um, we go about our questioning. Um, and then when it gets to the point after myself and the defense attorney has asked questions to the prospective 18 people in what we call the box, um, we would exercise peremptory challenges where we would kick people um, for a number of reasons. Um, they would leave and then we would pull someone from the audience, one of the 60 people waiting into the box. Um, well, the pandemic hit and everything looks completely different. And I, I think Nancy's case was one of the first ones to go. So her jury selection may have looked um, a little bit different than mine. I know it has continued to improve and the courts, our office and the public defender's office, I believe have gotten a lot more efficient and we've been able to kind of make it um, a little bit quicker because obviously since the pandemic, things are taking a lot longer. So essentially, our office got together with um, the panel and the public defender's office and the court and came up with about a 25 page questionnaire. Um, and not all judges in the courthouse right now are using the questionnaire, but we did use the questionnaire in my case based on the fact that a law enforcement um, personnel was the victim and some of the issues that were going on socially. And also because of COVID, obviously people um, who prior to the pandemic had got jury selection or jury duty would come and you were only excused if you had a hardship essentially, or um, you know, you weren't being paid for being there or you had a prepaid vacation, things of that nature. Well, now with the pandemic, obviously people had a lot of health concerns that people were concerned about touching, um, you know, the elevators or um, being in close contact with people. So 
our questionnaire um, was extremely extensive. Um, it covered a lot of areas, including do you have concerns about COVID or, or other health concerns that may cause you to not be um, essentially fit or suitable to be on um, that particular panel. So in my case, we use the questionnaire. So um, that made my jury selection go a little bit longer, but I believe it was more efficient overall. So um, essentially what happened during the pandemic is we called up in my particular case, I think about 150 jurors. And at the time that my case was going on, you could only do jury selection on one floor of the courthouse. So there was only one case picking a jury at any one time, um, just because of social distancing concerns. You know, they had chairs marked off in the hallways so that people weren't sitting next to each other. And um, in the courtroom where myself, the defense attorney and the judge were, and the defendant, so the main courtroom, I'll call it, um, we could only have 16 prospective jurors at any given time. So think about how different that looks um, so I'm questioning a box full of only four people, which is what it looked like when um, my case went to trial. There were only four people sitting in my jury box and the rest were in the back of the courtroom, which presented all sorts of challenges. Um, but for jury selection, it was extremely tough. Um, so we had about 20 people total, including myself and the other parties in my main courtroom. And then we had um, three other courtrooms that we had linked in through Zoom. So the technology actually, I think, worked really well, um, but it took some getting used to for everybody. Um, and so the judge would go about his questioning. Um, we'd, um, he'd speak directly to the people in the main courtroom, my courtroom, and then there'd be three remote courtrooms that were listening and following along. Um, so the challenge came really when we started getting to the peremptory challenges um, because you were kicking people who were in the box but were seated behind you. So, you know, as most good district attorneys know, I mean, part of kicking someone is you're, you're able to connect with your jurors, you're watching their mannerisms, you're speaking directly to them. It was very strange to be um, kicking people sometimes who were behind you or you weren't looking directly at all of the time because you were trying to also pay attention to the camera because you're speaking to courtrooms that are remote. Um, so once you kicked, um, let's say we got down to um, 11 people in the box and so you have to have 12. Um, so we had already exercised uh, our peremptory challenges. Well, we needed to then fill in that 12th spot and bring in a couple more jurors to our courtroom to get to the 16. Well, the difficulty was if we only brought in four or five jurors every time, it was gonna be extremely slow. So what my judge decided to do was take the 11 people who were in the box and put them in another courtroom and then bring in 16 people. Well, the strange part about that is then you're kicking people from your box who are not even in your courtroom. So you actually have to keep really good notes about who is seated in your prospective juror panel in your box, people who could be on your jury. Um, so there was all sorts of challenges. Um, I think we got it done. I think my judge did a great job, uh, but it just took a little bit longer. Um, although at the end of the day, I think justice was served and our, our jury was able to work um, efficiently and effectively. So despite all of the COVID challenges um, and although it looked a lot differently, we were able to get to the same end result. Um, but I would say the major difficulty for jury selection was not only not having enough people in the courtroom at any given time, but also the fact that jurors were wearing masks. I mean, the parties are wearing masks the entirety of the time. So when you're questioning them um, and you're speaking to someone in the very back of the courtroom and not in the jury box like normal, you can't hear them. Um, and it's hard to gauge someone's emotion and their expressions when their face is covered by a mask. So you have to learn to pay attention to other things and, um, you know, essentially improvise in a lot of ways um, so that you can make sure you get 12 people who are willing to work together. But yeah, it was definitely a challenge. So let's move on to the presentation of evidence in the, pre in the people's case. Mr. Roebuck, how did that go for you? Well, so I, I would just piggyback on something uh, Ms. Anderson said, which is that um, I've done a couple trials now during COVID and each judge I've found is, is doing it slightly differently. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, the basic premise of all of we talked about is the same, but each judge kind of goes about their individual courtroom and their rules differently um, as it was before the pandemic. But um, I can say that that doing evidence or putting on evidence was very different than anything I had ever experienced. Um, first, obviously it's the spacing that, that 
uh, Miss Anderson mentioned as well. You're, you're putting on evidence, but you literally have your back to jurors, whereas that normally would be maybe an audience member or someone from your office or a victim sitting there. You have to be very cognizant of uh, where you're sitting. Um, I mean, I'm a big guy and even just sitting in my seat, not moving, I had a juror ask a question if I could move because she couldn't see um, some of the technology because of where she was seated in a, in a taped off designated spot. So I think being cognizant of that, um, we were also restricted in both of my cases to uh, doing your examinations, for instance, while seated. Um, it's not something that I do normally. So um, it was very different to kind of force myself to stay seated and, and be engaging um, with my witness as well. Um, so I think that was kind of a challenge learning that. That also came into play later on when you're arguing, both uh, doing your opening and closing, um, because you again have to be cognizant of, of where your position is in the courtroom. The other thing um, that we had is they've moved the projector in the courtroom to essentially be behind or just to the side of your actual witness. Um, so it was just a completely different courtroom setup than what we're normally used to, um, as well as making, again, sh making sure that the people in the audience who are your jurors can actually see what you've projected on an overhead and that kind of thing. Um, I'd also say what was different is we were required, or I was in both of my trials, to essentially have um, duplicates of all of my evidence. So I had to have basically my evidence in three separate forms, um, which was, was sort of different. I had to have sort of permanent paper copies um, or discs that were marked by a clerk that were going to be preserved in the file. I had to create an exhibit binder with tabs for each exhibit and keep track of um, you know, which witness would look at each tab and direct those witnesses to that tab, that binder stayed on the witness stand. And then I had to have a, a third set of all of those exhibits on a thumb drive electronically so that um, I wasn't approaching the witness stand to basically do witness or uh, evidence walks and things of that nature. We had to do that sort of um, at a distance with me doing it remotely on the projector and the witness looking at a binder. So that was really different than, than what we've normally um, had to deal with. I'd also say that the pace of my trial, I don't know about the two other attorneys, but my trial went extremely slow. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that there were a ton of breaks for technology issues. Um, that threw off the pace. I think it made the jury sort of be a little bit more tired and anxious to leave and that kind of thing because they kept having to have these extended breaks to fix, fix projectors, fix microphones. Um, all of that I think played, in, uh, played a role. And then I guess just two other things that were different. Um, I had elderly witnesses. My victims were both in their 70s. And as we all know, that was a, a particular concern for public health, right? To bring down these people in their 70s, have them come in during a pandemic. Um, and have to be in the courthouse around other people, not at home quarantining, um, and sort of getting a judge to accept that and be willing to be flexible with those people so they weren't waiting, for instance, all day in the hallway um, was something new. And then lastly, argument um, was different. I know some judges I've heard allow attorneys to take off their masks during argument, but I was not allowed to do that in either of my two cases. And trying to be persuasive when you're literally covering, covering your face and all your facial expressions and um, your voice is muffled and you're trying to talk to people who are sitting basically in the back row in the audience that are your jurors um, was a significant challenge uh, compared to how we used to do trials. So those are just a few of the things. So back in the good old times pre-COVID, you would have a box of 12 jurors plus two or three more alternates, but they'd all be in the jury box and you could stand in the well and you could argue your case. Were you made to sit down when you argued, the, the three of you, or could you stand up and move about the courtroom with your mask on? I was given a, a, a very small area in the well behind the podium so that it sort of restricted my movement. Uh, I, I asked both of my judges if I could stand uh, basically in front of the uh, council table and just remain standing in that one area. Um, I did not move around. Uh, and um, part of the concern as well was the court reporter because the court reporter is so close to us. 
And um, so everything had to be sort of measured and marked out so that everyone felt comfortable with, um, with where I was standing. And um, I agree with Ryan uh, that uh, I gave my closing argument with a mask on and it was very, very different than anything that I had ever done um, pre-COVID. Uh, I want to follow up as well as about the exhibits. So be, before COVID, let's say we wanted to introduce a, a photograph of something, right? We could take the photograph to court, walk to the, to the witness stand, show it to the witness, and then come back to council table and put it on the projector that, I, that the jury box was basically in front of, right? So now we have the different forms where witness you would put the photograph in a, in a, what you called an exhibit binder. Is that right? Yes. And then, and then you would, how would you begin to ask questions about that and show it to all the jurors? Was that via projection? Yeah, so you're- For, you for me, I, uh, that's how I did it. I mean, essentially I, I would, you know, ask foundation questions, ask the witness to turn to tab two in the binder authenticate it. And then if they did that, um, I would project it on the projector with the electronic exhibits that I had on a thumb drive. The only thing that became a little bit difficult with is when you had like a video, let's say, I had a lot of videos in my case. And so um, the witness is seated on the stand, but the projector is directly behind them. So um, having them kind of scoot over and have to turn around to look at the video um, was challenging. I had multiple different videos um, in my case. So with a photograph, it works okay to kind of look at the binder, authenticate it, and then show it to everyone because they have a copy in front of them. Um, but with the videos, it became a little bit more challenging. We were able to um, do it in, in a way that was efficient, but I think it's, it's difficult. Or um, if you have a police officer or witness who needs to look at a map, um, even if you have a copy of the map in front of you, um, what if they need to draw on it? You know, let's say they want to give the location or the area um, that a vehicle drove or, a, um, you know, which way the suspect vehicle took off from the complex or something like that. Normally, we'd give them a marker, have them draw it, and then we'd put it on the visualizer to show it to everyone. So um, we've definitely had to be creative in the way we're doing things. Um, and I think the courts have worked really well with us trying to figure out a solution in a way that works for everyone. Yeah, and, and I would just add to that, um, I agree with, uh, with Kristen there with the, especially videos of interviews uh, being projected behind the detective while they're on the stand, it made it a little awkward, but uh, we, we, managed to, we managed to get through that all right. Um, but what I wanted to mention that this exhibit binder that was on the stand, after each, um, after each witness uh, left the stand, uh, both of my courtrooms uh, cleaned that witness stand. And they also cleaned the exhibit binder because someone else was coming in who would probably be looking at some of those exhibits um, as well as they always had uh, gloves available if the witness felt more comfortable wearing gloves while looking at the binder. That's, that's adding a lot of time, I guess, to the presentation of evidence. I see that, okay. Um, I wanna talk about how eliciting victim and witness testimony also changed. Um, and I wanna uh, kick back to our resident uh, expert in the area of prosecuting child abuse cases, um, Ms. Cochran. Um, yours are heavy, heavy victim ca cases that um, required uh, testimony sometimes from, from young, young people um, during this time, how, how was that different? Well, it was, um, I guess in, in some way, maybe you could say that for um, especially young kids, they didn't know the difference. So this has been, this is kind of their new normal, wearing a mask, going someplace, being able to take the mask off. Um, but I will say that in both of the cases that I've, that I've um, done during the pandemic, both of them multiple victim cases. This, the one that I talked about earlier had six victims. The second one had five victims. Um, and so there is oftentimes a lot of reassuring that has to take place prior to them coming to court. 
especially if you have uh, moms, dads, um, the caregivers. Uh, I'm not sure I, I want to come. I'm not sure I want my child to come. Uh, how can you um, assure me that everything is going to be safe? And so there was um, a lot of preparation time that was spent explaining the, um, the uh, courthouse procedure as well as the courtroom procedure. And um, the sheriff's department, I think has done a good job. They've um, set up a station in front of the doors of the courthouse. Everyone has to have their temperature taken before entering. There are sanitizing stations everywhere. As you mentioned earlier, chairs are blocked off to maintain social distancing if anyone sits in the, in the audience or in the um, hallways, excuse me. And then as far as the public watching the, the uh, trial, there were a couple seats that were available. Um, and oftentimes those would go to a lottery system that was um, taken care of by the court administration. But making sure that parents and caregivers were comfortable coming to trial and they themselves testifying, but assuring them that their, um, that their children would, would also be safe. So there was a, quite a bit of time taken um, in that preparation. And then um, as Ryan said earlier, and Kristen also, the jurors are spread out all over your courtroom. There are only a few in the jury box. Most of them are seated in the audience. So in, especially when I had um, younger children coming to court, they would walk in uh, with, their, with their little mask on, they would take the stand. And the way that the courtrooms have been set up, uh, that the judge is surrounded by plexiglass. And then also on the witness stand, uh, the witnesses are also protected by plexiglass. Both of my judges um, allowed witnesses to remove their masks while they testified. Um, I had, I kept my mask on, but they were allowed to take theirs off. And um, both judges had a, a, little, uh, a little spiel that they would give each witness and especially with the kids you know, like, oh, I see you came with your mask today and I'm gonna let you take it off now. And both judges very um, mindful of these young children in this already traumatic um, situation that they were going through, but then add on to it the plexiglass, the masks and things like that. Um, luckily, um, other, than, <laughs> other than the masks and the plexiglass and the uh, jurors seated throughout the courtroom, the testimony itself uh, and me wearing a mask, the testimony of my uh, victims themselves was very similar to what it would, would be, I thought, pre-COVID. Um, of course, some variations, um, but once people felt um, comfortable coming into the courtroom, um, they, they seem to do just fine. Interesting. Well, thank, thank you all for uh, your insight. Uh, it, I heard about a lot of ad adaptation and, um, and challenges and kudos to, to all three of you for being able to successfully prosecute your cases during this time. Um, I wanna ask about silver linings. Okay. I know that we've talked about challenges, right? So let's, let's, what parts of the, what changes did you find beneficial um, or more efficient in your cases? I'm gonna open that up to the panel. The whole process just kind of bonded my family together. Um, one of the things that Nancy mentioned is there's only, um, you know, one, maybe two seats for the prosecution and one seat for the defense and then one for the press. So usually if you have a victim testifying, they can have a loved one in court with them and or a victim advocate. So normally we would have entire families in, in the courtroom. They're kind of all able to watch the process. Um, since COVID, they now zoom in to one, one of our um, conference rooms. And so I had a lot of family on my case, um, as you can imagine. And I think 
um, despite the challenge of not being able to be in the courtroom, that kind of all bonded together. They would come here, um, they would, you know, um, take their breaks together. Um, they were a very close knit family and they were able to bond a lot with my victim advocate because the victim advocate would also stay back at our office and spend, you know, the whole day with them in um, the conference room. And so I think despite the fact that they couldn't be over um, in court, they were still able to, through the means that our office took to make sure that they could be a part of the process, they were still able to participate and show their support for the victims. So it was nice to kind of see the coming together of the families um, that I had in, in my case. So I think despite the um, difficulties, the silver lining would just be that they were still able to support their loved one and kind of come together through the process. Yeah, thank you. I, I would definitely agree with Kristen on that. I think it, it bonded people. And I think the silver lining uh, for me was that I saw that our process still works. And it works even when we're faced with a horrible, horrible disease that people are afraid of, um, that justice is still being served. Our victims are still being able to have their day in court. Defendants are still um, getting fair trials, even with these adaptations uh, that are occurring because of the pandemic. And I, it, it has just made me uh, feel even prouder of the fact that we have a system that works, um, that the defense bar has been willing to participate in this as well and um, that the courts have really gone out of their way to, to make people feel safe. And, I, and I'm, I'm just so happy that it's just, it proves how strong our system can be and that our system does work. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Roebuck, well, I mean, silver lining? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with what Nancy and Kristen said in terms of um, their observations. I guess from a practical standpoint or a procedural standpoint, I think that this pandemic has forced our court system, our office, the defense bar to um, look deeply at how we go about the trial assignment process. Um, and it was a little bit of, you know, learning pains or growing pains as we went along to try to kind of figure out a process, but coming from a volume unit where uh, we have a ton of cases. That old system of just showing up to court every morning in Department 9, never really knowing if you're going to get assigned a trial, having to use that trail period to maybe call ready on a case today, but have to be ready on a different case um, the following Monday morning, um, was a constant sense of sort of anxiety and shuffling. And um, I think that the way that we're doing it now, where it's much more refined with it, a check-in process, you know what courtroom you're going to go to a few days ahead of time, you know if you're going to be assigned out uh, within a few days ahead of time. All of those things I think have given us much more certainty. It's helped us communicate with our victims and our witnesses better in terms of giving them more solid timelines and not keeping them um, sort of in the dark about, hey, you might be needed tomorrow, it might be next week, it depends if we get trailed. We have a much better understanding of that now and I think that practically speaking has, has been a pretty big silver lining for us. Great. Sacramento County has uh, been basically a trailblazer for conducting jury trials during this time. Uh, the numbers as of the date of this recording are about 70 jury trials that, that have been completed uh, since the court opened back up in, in June of 2015. And folks can look it up, but that is head and shoulders above what any other county is doing. And I think that most of it is because of folks like you who are consummate professionals who, who rather quickly had to adapt to these uh, very different, very different uh, scenarios and situations. So kudos again to the three of you. Thank you very much for sitting with us today and, and having our listeners uh, take a peek into the courtroom during the COVID pandemic. Um, and thank you for uh, serving justice for the victims in your cases, even during COVID-19. Congratulations. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find all of the Justice Journal podcasts on our website at sacda.org, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube.